Hello, my friends. I'm Don Chapman, host of Origins, and so glad that you've joined us today for Origins. You know, Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and we use it to validate the truth of creation. And one of the best ways we do that is to bring some creation scientists to be with us and to have them share the results of their research. And today we have Dr. Russell Humphreys with us. Dr. Humphreys worked in the Sandia National Laboratory for over 20 years and uh, has uh, worked in many areas where physics has been applied uh, to, uh, with his work. It's so good to have you with us, oh, Doctor. my pleasure. And today we're going to talk about magnetic fields. Uh, we, this is a second show that we're doing on magnetic fields. And uh, all of this kind of got started with you reading a verse in 2 Peter. Will you share the verse with us? It's 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5. Uh, the earth was formed out of water and by means of water. And you began to say that even the magnetic fields, first you study the earth, but then this is applying way beyond that, that God took the elements or, or the, the stuff out of which water was made and used it to make our magnetic fields. Is that right? That's right. So it provided a clue as to a, a way that God could have made the magnetic fields of all planets and the stars and bigger things than stars even. And we'll talk about those today. And you wrote this up. You went out on a scientific limb by saying, I have a theory on how this applies to the magnetic fields of really the cosmos. And, uh, and you said, if my theory is true, you, and you gave some results that would be discovered that hadn't been determined yet. Will you share that with us? Well, last time we talked about the planets Uranus and Neptune. The right. Voyager space probe had not gone by those planets when I did my theory back in 1984. Uh, but my theory gave numbers for how strong the magnetic fields of those two planets should be, and the Voyager space probe confirmed those things. It hit the numbers that you said that would be if your theory was correct. That's right. And yeah. the other side had numbers that were way off, for, especially for the planet Uranus. So. And that's amazing that, uh, and, and validates your theory. Now, there are two other things that came out of, uh, the two other predictions you made as well. Yes, and let's talk about those. Uh, All right. Let's talk about Mars first. Uh, Mars' crust is strongly magnetized. And you see, my theory said that Mars would have been created with a strong magnetic field. But since its core is very small, uh, its magnetic field would have decayed away rapidly. We talked about that last time, how fast the fields go away. And so Mars has very little overall planetary magnetic field now. And it's because their core is different than the Earth, is that right? That's right. Yeah. So, the, but uh, my theory said it would have had a strong field in the past, back when God was forming the crust of the planets. So if it had a strong magnetic field then, the crust should still be magnetized strongly. And uh, there was a space probe, Mars Global Surveyor, that swooped very close to the surface of the planet and plotted out its magnetic field. And here you see uh, red and blue areas. The red areas are where the field is northward pointed up. The blue areas are where the field is pointed southwards. And the, the strength of the field in those, the magnetization of those rocks is strong. And uh, this means that Mars did have a strong magnetic field in the past. So it's, um, it was a validation of the theory, a, a third prediction. And now, if I, if I just talk to a layman here for a minute, if, if I took a compass uh, here on Earth, I, it's going to point to magnetic north. Mm -hmm. If I took that compass and I went to Mars, because the magnetization is in the crust, if I stood in different places, it might point different directions. Yes, and if you had one that uh, pivoted up and down, it would try to point down in one place and I see. up in another. Because it, it doesn't it have a core a or a central place, it's, it's throughout the crust. Right. That's it's... fascinating. All right, what else have you got there? Okay, uh, that was Mars. And yes. then there was another planet, Mercury, uh, that I made a prediction for. And it uh, turns out that all of this says that Mercury's magnetic field is young. So let's talk about this graph here. I've plotted for the techies a graph of time from creation in 4000 BC to 2000 AD, 6,000 years of history. And on this graph, the decay of magnetic fields should look like a straight line. So magnetic moment for the techies, that's just a measure of how strong the planet's magnetic field is. And I had a created value, my theory said. And then you see these two little dots down here. 
The first of them was a measurement that Mariner 10 made in 1975. So I found out that it had a half-life of uh, a fairly small number, 460, 470 years. And uh, that tells me the field is decaying fast, which it should, because Mer uh, Mercury is a very small planet, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have a large uh, core to maintain the magnetic field long. Another space probe went by Mercury, and that was the Messenger space probe. And it went by in January 2008, and there's a picture of Messenger right there. It's magnetic boom hanging out over the planet Mercury. And uh, I'm going to blow up this part of the graph now so that we can see a little bit more closely. And here's time from 1975 when Mariner went by here, uh, and the strength of the field plus the error bars. And the blue lines here and here show that slope that I already determined from my theory. And then Messenger measured a field down here with its error bars around here, and that laps over my prediction. But it may even be smaller because uh, there's a clean break between the two error bars. It may be that the, mess the Mercury's field is, is even smaller than I predicted. And my, you know, there's ways I could adjust my theory to fit that very easily. The other guys are going to have a real problem if Mercury's magnetic field has changed that much in just 30 years. So, so, but you were, it's dropping uh, at the rate or even a little more than what you thought it was. Exactly. Which kind of validates your theory and in fact does validate yeah, your theory. Yeah, it does. Fascinating. All right. Let's talk about the sun. Um, let's get to something really big. Okay. This is a plot of what the sun does to magnetic fields. Uh, there's, you know, when there are no sunspots on the sun, the magnetic field is kind of simple. It goes north and south, just like the earth. Okay. But the magnetic field in the sun is locked into this hot gas that the sun is made of, and the hot gas is a good electrical conductor, and it tends to drag magnetic lines of force with it. And the, the equator of the sun rotates faster than the rest of the sun. Hmm. Uh, the whole sun rotates in about one month, but the equator rotates in, oh, about 25 days or something like that. So it can do that because it's gaseous and yes, it and doesn't so have to like all move together. It's like a strong wind blowing on right, the equator okay. all the time. Yeah, all right. But that drags the magnetic field with it. So after a little while, you start to drag the magnetic lines of force with it, see? And uh, it, after a while, it will wrap the magnetic lines of force around itself many times like a ball of twine. And uh, you see these little huh. dots here? Yeah. Those are sunspots where the, the loops of mag you know, the field is just twisted and, and been yanked so tight that uh, pieces of it will pop out of the Earth's surface. And where it pops out and goes back in, it makes a pair of magnetic uh, lines of force that make dark spots on the sun, the you, sunspots. You were telling me that the sunspots are a result of the magnetic... Uh, uh, lines of force, right? And there's all, and they always come in pairs because yeah. there's a place where that line of force has come out, and then it gets pulled right. back in. So right. you've got an exit point and an entrance point right. into the gas by the magnetic field. Do I have that right? Yes. And all then, right. then the field reverses direction, and it starts unwinding, and it gets back to this original state where it's a simple field. Uh huh. So it adds magnetic field. Every 11 years, it twists itself and has more magnetic field, but then it unwinds itself and goes back to and it its original state. And it does this on state. a periodic basis? Yes, uh, on every 11, 11 years. 11 year cycle, it, that's amazing. Yeah, that's the sunspot cycle. Okay. But when it's in this simple state, it turns out that the field um, is 80% of what my theory says the magnetic field would have been at the beginning. So the sun is a large body, and yet it's working hard on the, that magnetic field, yet it hasn't been able to get rid of very much of it in all oh. this time. So the uh, sun is, I'm happy with this. Okay, that's exciting. <laughs> so not much energy loss per cycle of sun spot cycles. Now, so the solar system, the whole solar system, including the sun, that data fit the theory only if you meet certain biblical conditions. Now, smaller bodies like the Earth and Mercury and the Ganymede and all these other 
bodies in the solar system, they need a history um, to explain the data that's as short as 6,000 years. So uh, if the history were millions of years, there would be no magnetic field left in those smaller bodies. And then the planets and sun have to start as water. They can't start as sawdust or, or iron or nickel or calcium or any of those things uh, because there would be too little B. That's the physicist abbreviation for magnetic field. Uh, there would be too little magnetic field. And the sun couldn't have been uh, all hydrogen to begin with, like it now is, because then you'd get too much magnetic field. So you have to start with water, and you have to start only 6,000 years ago. So it fits the biblical time scale and this verse about the original materials God created. That, that is absolutely amazing. There's a lot of different stars, uh, but ordinary stars are most common like ours, and they have about the same strength, 10 gauss for you techies out there, as our sun does near its poles. And, but there are things called magnetic stars which have apparently wrapped themselves up like the sun does, but have kept their fields strong. And uh, they're about a thousand times stronger than the sun, uh -huh. a thousand gauss. And uh, then there are these things called white dwarfs, which are compressed, and they've gotten even stronger fields, and that fits my theory too, uh, over 10 million gauss, very strong. Then these things called pulsars, you've heard right. about them. Yes, sir. Uh, they have a whopping field. Uh, it's a trillion times the Earth's, uh, Earth's magnetic field. My goodness. A trillion gauss. And uh, then there are these things, these, these pulsars, a sub-variety of them that seem to have just about as big a magnetic field as anything we've ever uh, can imagine. Uh, and that would be 100 trillion gauss. They call those magnetars. And they don't understand them very well. That may be the largest magnetic field in the universe, is uh, the field of a, a magnetar. magnetar. So um, now I'm going to plot on a graph, for the techies especially, the density of different stars, grams per cubic centimeter, from the sun way over here to magnetars way out here. Okay. And uh, then the strength of the magnetic field. Uh, now for most stars over here, this little green area, including our sun, is down here. This red line is what, uh, what my theory would just predict without the stars wrapping magnetic field around themselves. But if they wrap the magnetic field around themselves a factor of 300 times, then uh, they could get a stronger field. And so magnetic stars are probably that kind of thing. And then white dwarfs are out here. They fit this range and the pulsars fit this range and the magnetars are up near the top end of that range. So your theory covers everything from our common star to the magnetar. So really exotic yeah. stuff out and, there. Uh, and yeah. so the theory, wherever we go, it seems to be valid. That's exactly right. God seems to have uh, included magnetic fields as part of his original uh, clue to creation. It fits the plan. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating. We've got some application to make. We've got to take a break right now. Don't you go away. We're going to see how significant this is for each of us. We'll be right back. Today's guest on Origins, Dr. Russell Humphreys, is a physicist and speaker with Creation Ministries International. Russ did scientific research for 22 years at Sandia National Laboratories and has published some 20 papers in secular scientific journals. He is the author of Starlight and Time, where he proposes a model for a young universe. Book orders are being taken at 800-616-1264. Russ has also been involved with The Rate Project which has produced breakthroughs on the subject of radiometric dating. Dr. Humphreys can be reached at Creation Ministries International, P.O. Box 350, Atlanta, Georgia 30127. Or visit the website, www.creation.com. We're back with Dr. Russell Humphreys, and we're talking about magnetic fields. And Dr. Humphreys, we started with Mars and looked at its magnetic fields. We worked our way up through the stars. Let's talk about galaxies and how, yeah. how uh, magnetic fields affect them. Yeah. Galaxies are big clusters of hundreds of billions of stars. 
and it turns out they have a magnetic field too. The galaxies Not just have the individual stars, field. but the galaxy, the galaxy as, a, as, whole as a whole has a magnetic field. And this is a plot of the magnetic field of a, of a galaxy that's moderately far away from us, and they can look at the light from that galaxy and analyze it and tell the strength of the magnetic field. So uh, uh, the strength is about uh, a million times smaller than the Earth's magnetic field, but it's a great big object. So the fact that it's big uh, has a lot to do with the, what's happening. It's impressive that it has that much field. And uh, the lines of force that we talked about, see these yellow lines that I've drawn yes, in on top of that same galaxy? It's called the Whirlpool Galaxy. A lot of our astronomer friends uh, know that, the amateur astronomers, uh, they follow, these lines of force follow the, the physical arms of a spiral galaxy. And uh, so the, the magnetic field is locked into those physical arms and as the magnetic, um, as the sp spiral arms get wrapped up by the galaxy, we talked about that one of the origin shows, right. the magnetic fields get wrapped up right along with it. And okay. so, uh, uh, this theory fits pretty good, um, so, but I, I don't know how God made galaxies and how he made the magnetic fields. I can only give you my guess All right. uh, for this. I would call an educated guess, though. <laughs> I hope it's educated. <laughs> yes, sir. Now, this is, this is my guess. God may have created galaxies as extremely dense water, that he took the entire mass of a whole galaxy, all those stars, and and made them as very compressed water. Um, and that would put it deep inside a black hole. Uh, this thing of a, is called an event horizon around which uh, at that point very strange things happen to time and space. But inside that black hole uh, would be this extremely compressed water. And it wouldn't be water anymore. It would be a hot gas uh, instantly after God created it. But there would be a strong magnetic field locked into this water. Uh, so it's deep in a black hole, and the mass is hundreds of billions times our sun, and the, uh, the density would be very high. It would be very dense material, and it would be all quarks uh, within fractions of a second after God created the water. Uh, it would turn into to quarks, uh, the basic constituents that we know about uh, of matter. So the field would be at 200 trillion gauss. Uh, just from, from the data, from if this guess is right, that's how strong. And the magnetic lines of force, the flux, would be a whole galaxy's worth of magnetic flux lines. Now, thing, a thing that compressed, lots of things happen physics-wise, things that release energy. And they, uh, this material would, would come squirting out in several directions. Uh, just like you, if you squeeze toothpaste, uh -huh. it's going to go... Like yes. that. So uh, this would happen to this object too. And it would make arms of very hot gas called plasma. And the astrophysicists like to talk about plasma jets coming out of objects. And here's a, a, a picture that one um, secular artist made of plasma jets coming out of a black hole. And I'm picturing this as being a, a thing that made the galaxies, these jets of hot gas, I'm then proposing that God made into stars. So jets squirt from this black hole, and they're, they would have to be 50,000 light years long. A light year is six trillion miles, and the diameter of a galaxy is 100,000 light years, so each of these arms would make up half of a galaxy. And there's magnetic fields that's embedded in those jets that are is carried out with it, and then the whole object God apparently gave some spin to so that it would tend to wrap itself up. So I'm suggesting this is how God made the stars and the galaxies both. That's and so here, here's what would happen to a galaxy. The, mag the rotation would wrap up these star arms. Here's a, an arm along here um, of a bar of stars that God has made, and it's, he's given it some spin. So that would carry magnetic lines of force with it. So all spiral galaxies uh, look like they've been winding themselves for uh, no more than 
three-tenths of a billion years, maybe less. But uh, the galaxies are not 10 billion years old, according to their clocks. They're, they're younger. And near and far galaxies look the same. And here I've shown the magnetic lines of force that would be embedded in this to begin with. Now we'll see what happens when, when it spins. There we go. If, if it spins, uh, the magnetic lines of force would be dragged with it and look like the magnetic lines that we see in galaxies. Which so, now starts to look like a galaxy. Yeah, a spiral galaxy. All right. So that's galaxies. Now, you're saying the distant galaxies' magnetic forces are young. How do you know that? Uh, because there was a paper that came out in the middle of 2008 that showed uh, when they first started looking at very distant galaxies, their magnetic fields, they found that they had strong magnetic fields. They were expecting weak magnetic fields. Because they of thought, the age. They, they, they thought, thought they those would things, be very old. Yes, okay. were very old. And, now uh, they're and, seeing that they're normal. Yes, and that's, uh, that's what uh, my cosmology would say. Their, their strength is the same as nearby galaxies. This is a nice infrared picture of one of the galaxies. Uh, and they're the same as near galaxies. And so that means there's no generator in the galaxies generating the magnetic fields. They're, they were there at their creation. That's what the word primordial means. If you see a scientist use that, he means when it started. He That's may right. not be thinking the start was creation, but the fields are just left over from creation. Now, it says here that the universe may be God's biggest magnet. Yes. Help me understand Okay, that. well, um, my, uh, there are scriptural clues that there's waters above the most distant galaxies, the waters above the firmament. Uh, okay. And we won't go into that, but I've drawn it, and it's, and it's uh, if there were waters, um, and those waters were smaller, and God expanded them out, then uh, you can calculate a magnetic field from that. So there would be a primordial, there's that fancy word again, meaning yes, original. Yes, I understand. Uh -huh. um, and the theory magnetic field, there's my physicist shorthand for magnetic field, okay. would be a certain small number. Now that number is too small to measure now, but sometime in the future they may be able to measure the field between galaxies, the strength of the field. And I'm hoping they'll find uh, uh, this number. So we don't know. but. Even though it's a small field, it's a really big thing. you think you know what the thing. film is, yeah, okay. So uh, that would be God's biggest magnet. Wow. <laughs> so, so, uh, so magnetic fields, in summary, they, they, they show God's handiwork. They're a fingerprint that he left on creation. And uh, up in the heavens, we see these big magnets. There's magnetic fields of planets, moons, asteroids, meteorites. Uh, sun and stars and pulsars and even these strange things, magnetars and uh, galaxies and maybe the whole cosmos itself is a magnet. So uh, there, and like we were talking about, uh, there are a clue to how God made the, the cosmos, what he made it of, and for nearby smaller objects like our solar system, uh, there are a very definite clue that he made them not long ago, only thousands of years ago, and that not billions. This is, this is so exciting. I, I love the concept that it has, that uh, the magnetic field is in a sense God's uh, fingerprint. Mm -hmm. Everything he made to put a magnetic field in to show us that, uh, that he indeed made it and uh, made it all the same. From our planet to the farthest galaxy, there's these magnetic fields that God put in everything. That's right. And, they, and, and I love the hint that you're giving us. I know you can't be dogmatic on the galaxies, but the hints that keep coming through that it's a young Earth and a young galaxy and ga young cosmos, mm -hmm. after all, that God has made. Yes. Uh, Thank you. It's so. been such a privilege having you today. And the insight to magnetic fields is something that, that myself and probably most of our viewers have never seen as such an incredible testimony to the work of God. My friends, the farther we look, the deeper we look, the more we see the fingerprint of God and the validity of His Word. So don't you forget that it's God's view that He created you. And that should be your worldview too. Thanks for joining us on Origins today. Hope you'll join us again soon. And until then, God bless you, my friend.
thank you for watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins, program number 1202, Cornerstone Television, Well, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family.